Hi, everyone. Welcome to our special Friday live stream here on Eric's channels and our third stage channels. We're broadcasting on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, all our favorite social media platforms. And I'm really excited for today because we have a special panel of our our digital stratosphere 2022 speakers. So we're going to kind of provide a preview, a little teaser into what we'll be talking to at the event. So first things first, I'm Kyler Cheatham, Global Marketing Director here at Third Stage, and I am joined by uh, a plethora of our experts here. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, kind of let us know their specialty as um, they'll be covering a bunch of topics at our digital 20, our digital stratosphere 2022 event. Just some logistics to start. If you could just pop in where you're viewing from today, we'd love to kind of get to know our audience a little bit better. And then also our Digital Stratosphere event will be hosted on February 8th through 10th. It's a completely virtual event and it is completely complimentary this year. We have three days packed with great speakers from both the third stage team and some of our great sponsors. So if you can head over to stratosphere2022.com or wherever you're watching, the link should be in our description. Um, so from there, we will turn it over to Eric, who is probably our most well-known panelist here. So Eric, want to give us a, a quick intro for all of you that don't know Eric? Sure. My name is Eric Kimberling. I'm the CEO of Third Stage Consulting, and I've been uh, doing ERP and digital transformation consulting for about 25 years now. And uh, most of that time has been spent doing technology agnostic uh, independent consulting. So i uh, glad to be here today. Excellent. And also you forgot big influencer in the ERP space and digital transformation space. Um, so thank you for joining us. Eric will be kicking off each day of our um, Stratosphere conferences. So let's head over to Teresa Richardson. Hello, how are you? Uh, my name is Teresa Richardson and I'm a manager with Third Stage and my focus is on operational excellence, process optimization, and OCM. Um, I've worked in a lot of industries from healthcare, automotive, wealth management, IT obviously, um, logistics, and I love what I do. It's a passion of mine. So, hello. Awesome. Yeah, and Teresa always has the best energy. So her <laughs> her topics, she'll be joining us a few times um, and will be on a few panels as well. And she is, I, I think, covering the most broad range. And she's on our business intelligence panel and then also will be doing a keynote on organizational change management. So definitely a jack of all trades there. So let's go over to one of our directors of strategy and transformation here, um, Braden. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, Braden Gerbig, uh, director with Third Stage. Um, Going to be talking a little bit about uh, supply chain. I imagine uh, we're seeing a lot of activity around uh, quote to cash and some of the integration challenges related to uh, you know the supply chain challenges we encountered last year, and I'm sure uh, more to follow this year. But uh, uh, I've been in consulting uh, 20 to 25 years in uh, various systems, but also operations. Uh, so looking forward to uh, chatting more about supply chain. Excellent. Yep, definitely our operations specialist there and is gonna solve all of the global supply chain problems. Right, Brandon? <laughs> no, no pressure. No problem. Yeah, right, right. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Christy Barber, who is our small business specialist, has a very diverse background. So Christy, if you, if you don't mind giving us a quick intro to what you do here at Third Stage. Yeah. So my name is Christy Barber. I am help with mostly small uh, business side of helping prep uh, for your implementations, getting ready for selections, all of that. I have a strong background in finance and then I've uh, worked predominantly in manufacturing distribution areas, but then a variety of industries, kind of anything from retail to um, get really, really technical when we're doing a lot of classified stuff for the government like NASA. Absolutely. And, and Christy comes from a family and herself a, of entrepreneurs, so really helps our small businesses kind of see a holistic view of their digital transformation and just overall business consulting opportunities. So excited to have everyone with 
us today. Um, so I wanted to share kind of just what everyone will be talking about. So we have top supply chain management strategies that Braden will be covering on day one. Teresa will also take us through organizational change and why that really is the key to transformation success. And then creating and managing our target operating models. We'll have some business intelligence there and then scaling for growth. Christy and one of our excellent PMs and senior managers, Amanda, will take us through some small to medium business mid-market best practices. So that's kind of what we're talking about today. So I think we're going to kick it off um, with just going to you, Teresa, because talking about organizational change. And I think that's a good kind of foundation to set our conversation. So do you want to kind of give us um, a little insight into why you feel like that's something that is so specific for businesses to really focus on within a digital transformation in 2022? Sure. So I think I'm going to get a plaque because I've said this like 10,000 times that, you know, unless your process is like 99.9% .9 automated, people are involved in what you do. So a lot of times, you know, the focus is on the ERP implementation, it's technology, it's software, but someone's behind the software. There's a process behind that software. And if, if we don't take that into consideration to understand, you know, where are we currently at? What's our current state? And then you have your future state, everything in the middle is the transition. So if all of those pieces are not considered and discussed and we don't bring the team in to be part of that solution. Um, in addition to the technology solution, you're going to miss an opportunity for buy-in. So people don't go out and they don't spend, you know, a lot of money for an ERP and expect it to fail. They want it to work. And if you don't include the people behind the technology and in doing the process, you're going to miss an opportunity for buy-in, which impacts your adoption and usage rate. So to me, that's a cornerstone of what we need to talk about in terms of these implementations. Yeah, and I'm, I'm curious as to your take on that, Christy, because I assume a lot of our small business community, organizational change can kind of fall into that nice to have category, but a lot of times we don't have a ton of capital, budgets are tight. And, and how do you explain to your clients that it really is something that is a main pillar or core deliverable within their project? We try to bring it in from the start. So even if it's not it's scoped into the project or whatever, we're still trying to help navigate that along the way and showing each of the clients that come in of, hey, this is something that's a change issue and it could be mitigated by doing X, Y, Z you know, it, is that something where you can find some budget and we can put together, you know, something that would work specifically for them that stays within that. Whereas, Teresa, you're seeing companies that they have the um, budgets to do that. And so we they have a full program going where we just have to take that and scale it back and try to help show the value that comes from it. Absolutely. Well said. Um, and I'm curious, Brayden, from a supply chain standpoint, what is kind of the people or organizational change role in supply chain? And is that something that should be a main consideration within those strategies? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, when we're talking about transformation uh, as it relates to supply chain, we're talking about a number of systems in the value chain uh, that are going to affect change within the organization. So that means that some of those frontline processes will change how they're uh, receiving information uh, and then reporting out on that information. And as you know, on the supply chain challenges that we've experienced recently, uh, the more information, the better. Uh, we're getting at a more detailed granular, granular uh, level in terms of uh, trying to understand where the where the challenges are, are uh, delaying processes, delaying inventory, uh, uh, all the logistics that go into it. So it, it really starts at that planning effort and getting into uh, uh, understanding the, the integration from the quoting uh, all the way through to production and inventory management, and then everything uh, going out the door and being able to track uh, from the time it leaves the door to the time it's received. So uh, there's a number of systems that are impacted, and then the people that are using those systems uh, experience quite a bit of change during, during a transformation or ERP implementation. Yeah, kind of going back to what Teresa said at the beginning of this conversation is it is there obviously is a human side to every sort of business process 
or supply chain in this case. And I'm going to go over and get Eric's take on this in just a second. But I want to remind our audience that if you have specific questions for our panelists, go ahead and pop that in whatever comments you're looking at, whether it's YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, anything like that. And we can actually see them here. So we this is a live Q&A and we can ask them. We'd also love to hear what do you want to hear at Digital Stratosphere? You know, what is something that you're very interested in within these topics? So definitely um, looking for some engagement from our amazing audience there. But Eric, I wanted to go over to you and talk specifically about um, your content that looks at kind of digital transformation within the 2020s and tw and trends that we'll see there. And from this perspective of talking about supply chain and people, a main trend I assume that you might look at is something like labor shortage and how do you, you know, identify and evaluate those issues as a business. So I wondered if you could kind of share some of your take on that. Yeah, so one of the things I'll cover is, is labor shortages and, and human capital management overall, just sort of a broader um, emphasis in recent years on human capital management, which was a trend that was already in play, but with the pandemic and now supply chain shortages, labor shortages, it's just emphasizing or re-emphasizing the need for better human capital management, attracting and retaining uh, the best possible talent. So that is one of the um, one of the things that are being fueled by the current environment we're in right now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, obviously, very front of mind for a lot of our clients. And I, I kind of want to go back to you, Christy. You're always the one where I'm like, what's happening in this? Because <laughs> I assume labor shortage must be something that you might touch on in your um, in your content when scaling for growth. And, and what does that kind of look like for some of your clients? Is that something that they're kind of coming up against within 2022? Yeah, they are. And similar to what we talked about in our podcast last week, the smaller businesses are starting to see they can't hire people to fulfill the, the jobs that need to be done. And I've seen this with a handful of clients where they can't find good talent. They can't find people that want to stay. They'll come maybe stay for a couple days, a week or two, and then they leave the company, even though they have good pay, all of that. And you're seeing more and more companies trying to find a piece of technology to replace what the what a person could do and there it's good and bad and <laughs> you see that at restaurants where you go to a kiosk instead of talking to a person and what is that going to look like from a small business side where that's expensive to do and how are they going to fight um you know technology versus human capital in a, in a way of bringing that in and so I don't know. Like I've seen a lot of clients, they're just struggling with it. And then the cost too of, I need good talent, but can I afford to pay for, you know, two times the amount of what somebody should have? Um, so then you start getting on to the financial side. Absolutely. And, and I'm curious, um, Teresa, your kind of look on that from a business process side, you know, how do your business processes change with all of this kind of turmoil and uncertainty in the marketplace? And how can you make sure that you're planning for uncertainty, if you will? So so one of the things that just popped in my head and excuse my eyeballs, they always go up in there when I'm thinking. So I'm not crazy, guys. I'm just thinking. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that popped in my head um, when Christy and Eric were talking is, the, is how do you show your team value, right? People don't come to work to do a bad job. They want to be involved. They want to you know, be part of the solution when things are changing. Um, the most dangerous thing that could happen within a company or the culture is when you hear silence, right? If you don't get that feedback or if you don't have people coming to you with, you know, solutions, that's when it becomes dangerous, in my opinion, because they don't feel like they're valued or part of that process. Um, some of the, the best companies I've ever worked for have the engagement and then interaction with everybody on the team to say, how can we make this better? You know, I don't think there's anyone in any company that's smarter than anyone else. Everyone has their own perspective and what they can share. So if you can capitalize on that, and that's a lot of the change management, the process optimization, if you can pull them into what you're doing and how you're doing it, you're going to be a, a lot better off, right? When you get the silence, that's when you have a problem. That's when when people aren't giving their ideas or they don't want like, okay, I'm done. 
they're probably looking for another job. You're in trouble. So I would say, although we have a lot of challenges now, the best thing a company can do is to really start investing in their people. Even asking an opinion is helpful. I mean, how many people walk around feeling like they're not valued and not heard? If you can tap into that, you've just gone a long way. So, yeah. Were you a therapist in another life, Teresa? Mm -hmm. Or what? Were you, were you a therapist in another life? Or I tell my husband I used to be a race car driver because I'm just <laughs> really but he doesn't believe me, but uh, I just, I just value people. I value people. I value their opinions. And I, I think I get a lot of information that other people don't when mm -hmm. you take that perspective. Things yeah. don't because they break. There's a reason. And if you're not yeah. asking the right person, then you're in trouble. Absolutely. I think that's so important as we go through this so, so great resignation, you know, and really building that company culture so that people want to, and you can have that retention initiatives. Absolutely. So I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about some technologies. We've kind of been looking at the people side. And I wonder if we can go to the technology side. And I wonder if I could go to you, Brayden. And it seems like a trend that we've been seeing in the industry is focusing on more best of breed systems for things like supply chain management, as opposed to a core ERP system. Is that something that you've seen or that you plan to kind of cover from the technical side within your content at Digital Stratosphere? Yeah, we see it quite a bit, actually. It's um, uh, not uncommon to uh, look at, uh, you know, the the at various points in, in the value chain, uh, looking at quoting system, for example, or warehouse management system, or uh, specifically at MRP. Uh, these areas are all uh, very, uh, detailed in nature in terms of uh, the unique aspects of uh, each client. And so th they want the systems to reflect that, that nature. Uh, so existing reflection of existing process. And, and there is a lot of tenure at a, a lot of our clients, uh, folks that have been there for quite a long time. Uh, and so there's that knowledge management component and how that translates into a system. And so sometimes uh, the way that we've always uh, done things is difficult to fit into an ERP. And so that's where best of breed does come in. Uh, you can use best of breed in a lot of cases to uh, shore up uh, a legacy strategy or try and improve a system uh, for, uh, you know, the near term as you look to a longer term solution. And this applies typically at the, the larger levels. Uh, so the tier one vendors um, that we're, we're used to seeing, uh, you might have some stop gaps in getting to that next level. Um, so yeah, best of breed is, is extremely important and, and it helps um, evolve the technology in an environment where uh, we do have a lot of very mature processes in some cases. Absolutely. And I, I definitely want to expand on that. We do have a question from the audience that I think is a, a good one um, for maybe Braden and Eric. Um, so we have uh, one of our, our users on our YouTube channel is asking about an integrated solution for textile manufacturing and supply chain processes in Bangladesh. Um, and he had said that his challenge is that he's failing to find a solution, he or she, I'm sorry, failing to find a solution provider from Europe or the US or from anywhere that has a proven solution for the textile sector. So I think this is a great piece that we'll actually cover in our emerging markets that um, our uh, VP of our new Africa office, Clifford, and then our other director of transformation and uh, strategy here at uh, third stage will cover so definitely make sure that you attend that session the emerging technology session but what do you do when you're in an, an area or maybe a marketplace where you're not finding the the best technology or any technology options or even maybe support teams system integrators you know con uh, consultants in that so it looks like we're asking about the textile industry here so I think probably let's go to you first, Eric, as I know you've been kind of talking about these emerging markets and, and new verticals and, and get your feedback on this question. Yeah, so I think there's a there's a few different options. I mean, first of all, you have your like Braden was talking about the best of breed options. So perhaps you find technology that can handle the manufacturing component of uh, textile um, manufacturing. 
but it doesn't handle some of the other needs that you have, in which case maybe you need a different supply chain solution or a different warehouse management solution to to uh, plug some of those. So it, it, there's a lot of flexibility and modularity in today's system that didn't exist to this degree um, years ago. So that's one option is the best breed. The other option you have is certainly looking out to with your normal, all your usual suspects of, of software providers. You might, it might be that you look beyond SAP and Oracle and Microsoft and look at some of the more niche focused solutions. And there's a lot of them throughout the world too. Um, the more global we do, the more we find there's a lot of local and regional software mm -hmm. solutions that specialize in certain verticals or tailored to a certain market. Yeah. So there's just a lot of options out there, I guess I'd say. So there's, I'd, I'd say explore your options, look at those best of breed and niche options. And worst case scenario, if you have to customize or create some sort of uh, custom solution to uh, preserve the competitive advantage or the specific processes that are unique to you, then that's okay too. That's not the end of the world, you know commercial off-the-shelf software vendors, which are a terrible idea because you should be using their software instead, but that's that's more of a sales message than the reality. So that'd be my, my overall suggestion of, of options to consider. Good, and I, I think that is a, a definitely an important piece of kind of understanding what the, the options are out there. I wonder if anyone on this panel has textile experience and then might want to chime in. Yeah, I, I haven't done uh, a lot of work in textiles, but I will say that, uh, you know, to Eric's point, there are a number of options out there and available. I think the key is going through a, uh, a, a selection process that that looks in detail at the need uh, so you can leverage things like best of breed. Uh, also, uh, you know, in, in technology now uh, with uh, cloud and, and hybrid options, uh, there's a lot to choose from um, that you don't necessarily need localization for. Uh, however, localization is key in terms of support, and we need to uh, uh, look at that that need. Um, you know, in terms of um, textile in Bangladesh, for example, we need to understand uh, how how uh, vendors are supporting uh, in those locations, um, and, and that that helps uh, in the selection process to understand the SI and and how your implementers are available and, and able to support in, in a localization instance. Absolutely, and I, I know when we kind of go back to the best of breed in collaboration with this conversation, specific verticals, specific areas of the business, um, those types of things. Christy, I know that you've been seeing kind of that migration to some best of breed systems in the small business or mid-market community. Um, can you kind of tell us what you've been seeing? Yeah, it's funny. I just had a conversation with a vendor about it earlier in the week of how they're even seeing the, the, the trend as well. And I think what I'm seeing is some of these small businesses have a lot of unique components to them and they can't just use an ERP to handle all of that. They may need something uh, specifically to purchasing and they're using an outside um, technology component for that. A lot for CRM too. They could have already been on Salesforce and they don't necessarily want to come over. It makes more sense to stay with that. And then with maintenance, managing maintenance on their trucks, um, any type of tooling that they use and is third party. And even with um, fixed assets as well, even though ERPs have them again, they're looking for softwares that can add value in a different way. So what are some of the softwares that you all have seen kind of in that best of breed area um, that you, you've seen your clients interested in? And that's open to everyone. Well, I think the most common ones are Salesforce, like Christy mentioned on the CRM side and uh, Workday on the human capital side, or in, in some cases, financials as well. Um, those are two of the better known ones, uh, but there's a, there's a ton of them out there, but those are just... I think what, what you're seeing is you're seeing these these upstart, not that, don't get me wrong, Workday and Salesforce are not upstarts, but they at one point were, and there's other upstarts like them that are that are uh, sprouting up in a number of different verticals. But you're seeing a lot of um, solutions like that pop up in the industry that are just giving, giving uh, enterprise buyers more more options. Yeah, and, and, and do you, maybe we'll go to Teresa for this one. Do you feel like having um, additional options within the marketplace is kind of empowering your clients a little bit more? I know we used to, you know, for the past 10 years, really just 
work with a kind of a core group of vendors, but now it seems like the client has more options. Is that something that provides, you know, a, a, some additional, I don't know, power to the clients to be able to choose something that's best for them? Uh, a- absolutely. Uh, I, I'm actually working with a client right now that we've introduced the, the system that the overall organization feels uh, is best for them to use, but the network that they have is insane. So they're calling people saying, hey, what are you using? Well, we're using this. And so that creates, um, it does create options, but it also creates another challenge to understand why they don't want to integrate to the new system. So again, it's it's understanding why they don't feel it uh, is best for them and why do they feel they need to call their you know, compadres down the road or what have you and understanding what is really best for you as an organization. So yes, you have options, but what is the best option is the question. Most people cost effective, et cetera, et cetera. And it sounds like even, you know, going back to what Braden said, that's really discovered within the evaluation process. So let's kind of talk about the evaluation process and um, I'll go to you, Eric. What are the first steps when you're considering going through a digital transformation, you've decided you need a new technology, what's kind of the first step to ensuring that this is going to be successful for you as a business? Well, the the very first step is to work with the executive team to articulate what it is they're trying to get out of this transformation. Um, Too often we get clients or we talk to potential clients that say, well, we don't really have a uh, a purpose or direction other than the fact we have to replace our old systems. And the risk with that is that may be very well a good reason. And for a lot of companies, that is a real reason why they're they're sort of uh, being um, not not being forced, but they're sort of jumping into this transformation mm-hmm. initiative, um, especially in today's day and age where a lot of vendors are sort of trying to push their legacy customers over to the cloud. Mm-hmm. That's not enough reason on in and of itself. You you also need to have a a greater purpose of what is it you're trying to accomplish? What are the priorities for the transformation? What do you want to look like at the end of the day on the other side of the transformation? Um, All those are questions that start at the executive level and that sort of sets the guardrails for downstream evaluation activities like defining what your business requirements are and prioritizing what those requirements are. You could do that requirement exercise without having done that executive alignment exercise but when you do that, you're sort of sh- shooting in the dark. You're, you're oftentimes basing your requirements or your perceived requirements based on what you've always done or what the frontline employees think they need versus making sure it's aligned with what the bigger picture strategy and goals are that the executive team is trying to accomplish. So I'd say that's the first thing is to have a clear articulation of what the strategy, goals, and objectives of the project are, then mm-hmm. getting into requirements, and then you start looking at specific technologies based on those requirements from there. Absolutely. And- and what happens, Brayden, if I assume that it's it's much easier said than done, executive alignment sometimes, because everyone has their kind of own goals and agenda. So how do you work as a coach in these situations to kind of help companies or organizations secure that alignment? Yeah, it's a good point that alignment is a bit of a challenge uh, in some cases because it occurs at multiple levels. Uh, and we try and uh, get the message clear at the top, uh, understanding, as Eric mentioned, the corporate goals and objectives. Uh, you know, for example, if the one of the goals and objectives is uh, significant growth, then we're looking at a system that needs to be scaled to that growth. Uh, and that helps us determine in selection uh, the right fit. Uh, we don't want to go with a tier two kind of uh, mid-range uh, package when we know that, uh, you know, the the goal is really to to become a much larger organization and, and a tier one package uh, might be more or a better fit. Uh, so, you know, understanding those objectives comes in a very uh, simple uh, conversational exercise where we're uh, kind of interviewing, uh, you know, where do you see the company uh, going in the next couple of years? Tell us about uh, the objectives, how you're going to get there. And mapping that out in a way that uh, you know it's a discovery process that that is uh, very conversational and very uh, very uh, guided in terms of the intent of 
you know, we're looking to fit a system. So uh, let's dig into what your challenges are. Let's dig into uh, where you have pain points. And, and that's that's how we get to a uh, kind of a, a solidified message that we can then uh, disseminate throughout the rest of the organization and, and really get uh, uh, additional feedback at the other levels to to match up with that that top down message. Absolutely. And I, I think that's such a great exercise that you kind of help discover those objectives. I wonder um, for you, Teresa, in that your organizational change, how, how do you deal with maybe an executive team that's like, oh, you know, we have an awesome culture. You know, we have we have no need for change management. We'll be totally fine. And, you know, kind of going in and say, well, maybe you do, but this is still a main priority. How do you have that conversation? You know what? I'm sitting here thinking I'm like a Cheshire cat because I got this big smile when he was talking. I'm like, wow, do I have this some examples for you? So, you know, just I think what's been helpful for me is to pull some of those examples out um, that I've had with past clients to have their minds thinking like, OK, it's a good idea. OK, I didn't think of that. And through a line of questioning, um, it's helpful to have them come up with the idea themselves. So there's more of a buy-in. Uh, when you put certain things in front of an executive or a decision maker and you, they're like, oh, I didn't think of that. That's a good thing, right? So you don't want your potential uh, future client to fall into the pits of your past clients. Mm -hmm. So it's always, in my opinion, it's always helpful to, when I, when I hear or I see those things, it's a signal to, okay, let's talk about some experiences and ask them some probing questions and get them thinking. And then they're like, oh, wow, I didn't think of that, but that's a, that's my idea. That's a great idea. So honestly, that's kind of how I've done it in the past. Um, but to Eric's point and to Braden's point, if you don't ask everybody their pain points or issues or their future needs, once that system is purchased and it doesn't it doesn't solve the problem of other departments or other sectors of the business, you're going to have them go out and look for other solutions like we just talked about prior to. So then you have a new separate problem, right? So it might take a little bit more time, but getting the pulse on the business is so very important from every aspect in a nutshell. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I wonder, Christy, from, from your experience, obviously, in small businesses, we see our client community, they wear a lot of hats and a lot of them are generational. So it can be, I assume, a bit of a challenge to secure that alignment. How important is that for small businesses and how do you go through the specific evaluation process? Yeah, it's really important, especially to your point when it's family owned and you have multiple generations working and you see Maybe you have four generations in your business and generation one and two are on the same pace. Three is like, I don't like any of this. And four wants to go do something else. Like, how do you take them all into one room and you get everybody to get on a similar path of where the business needs to go? And that's what I try to do in the executive alignments that I have is we, even though we have ideas coming from all different sides, there's some commonality. Let's find the commonality and we start building from there of what the company wants to accomplish overall. And to your point, Teresa, bringing in some of the, the change management that pops in on that side and just headbutting or whatever it looks like of being able to mitigate some of those risks ahead of time. So then when the project does start, we know very clearly what they are and can track them so they don't blow up on the backside. 100 100 percent absolutely and and you know being professionals that we are we can i can see them i'm sure you can see them those resistant builders even when you're in the room and you're you're seeing people and the people who aren't responding or the people that have their arms you know crossed <laughs> on or whatever those are clear indicators okay we need to figure out what this is about um, so the techniques that we use, we are able to, you know, flush them out and come up with some, uh, some solutions to that. So, yeah. Definitely. I'm so excited to dig into that more because digital stratosphere is really where we lay out those actionable tactics. Um, and again, I, I kind of want to switch gears a little bit to make sure we're kind of covering everything today, because if you've listened to any Eric and my podcast, we could talk about OCM all day long. 
Um, so I want to make sure we can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I want to kind of get over to you, Brayden, because arguably you have one of the most hot topics that we've seen now become a conversation in mainstream media and politics and every piece kind of of our our, our culture um, and, and global strategy. So when it comes to the supply chain challenge, what are some things that clients or potential clients can do today to take within their controllables, even though obviously there's external factors that they can't control? What are what are some things they could do today? Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It, it differs by every client, by every situation. Um, the challenges are are broad and they're also deep. Uh, so, that, you know, they're, they're not easily solved, uh, but getting... Uh, better information, getting better detail, uh, you know, at inventory levels, for example. Um, I've seen uh, firsthand quite a few, um, uh, you know, operations where, uh, you know, inventory is um, somewhat nebulous in terms of uh, not only where it is, uh, but also, uh, you know, in terms of uh, life cycle of, of production of, of parts and pieces, uh, status, um, you know, things like uh, change order processes, uh, become more important because you want to dial in your your uh, standard parts and your part lists and everything else. Uh, you don't want to have uh, a lot of changes uh, coming in because change creates costs. Um, so, you know, really getting a handle on cost and reducing cost wherever possible, uh, tightening up the inventory, getting a better understanding of your supplier network. Um, all of these things are in really extremely important right now, uh, and systems can help with that, but it's also a process. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of things that can be done now can be fixed with uh, uh, some exercise on process, and that, that is a way to step closer to a system and step closer to a new solution, uh, but just working through the manual workarounds right now to get them better, better dialed in, uh, and then alignment is key as well. You have to have great uh, cross-functional communication right now uh, because the challenges don't slow down uh, they keep coming and uh, the only way to fix that is to you know have that that interaction between teams uh, so that you're getting things done in real time excellent yeah I, I think those um, I'm excited to hear your presentation because um, you touched on a lot of big things there like diversification of your vendor network you know where where are your supply chain where are they located distribution in, in that area. So I know we're going to learn a lot from you in that um, that keynote on day one. Eric, I, I kind of want to go big and then I'm going to get small, right? So Eric oversees a lot of our, obviously our global business and we have a, an office in Europe. We have one in Asia Pacific and we just opened one um, in the Africa market as well. So Eric, do you ever see specifically with supply chains that they might be, you know, cranking stuff out and doing really well in one area or one location of their business and but there might be some breakage in another area and how do you secure alignment in that section when you have one person at the table saying like we're, we're killing it we're doing great and then the other person being like we we can't get raw materials what how do you advise in in that um overall scope yeah it's a, that's a interesting question um so I think you're seeing a lot of that in today's day and age. You're seeing uh, a lot of the si supply chain outages are being caused not by mass uh, shortages across the board. They're being caused by one small piece that's cascading throughout the entire supply chain. So, and it might be multiple small pieces, but it's not, in general, it's not that the overall supply chain is breaking down in, in many cases. Oftentimes it's that I've got, you know, 99% of the raw materials I need, but I'm missing that one critical, that 1% that's critical. I can't complete my product until I get that 1%. So to your point, even when we look within uh, organizations, we have to think, uh, we have to think more holistically or completely about the end to end process and where the breakdowns might be contributing to failures along the way. And in some cases, like in the, in the case of supply chain management, uh, to build on Braden's point, it might be that we have to change our way of thinking. It's it's a change in behavior. It's a change in strategies. It's a change in culture in many cases. So now, for example, instead of thinking of uh, uh, minimizing inventory, which has always been, you know, since the 90s, that's sort of been the focus of corporate America and other parts of not just corporate America, but corporations worldwide. Um, now with the supply chain, the supply chain disruptions, we're seeing the 
uh, consequences of that. You know, when you when you run when you run with such a razor thin margin of error, you get one material that's out of stock, and now all of a sudden your your uh, whole supply chain is thrown off. So what that's forcing organizations to do is to have better visibility and all the stuff that that Braden mentioned, but also just thinking differently about our supply chains as far as stockpiling inventory if we need to, maybe not across the board, but maybe just for critical mm -hmm. component materials. So those are just some of the things that, that come to mind is um, you have to look at the whole end-to-end -end process, whether you're looking at a supply chain or whether you're looking at your end-to-end -end process internally as well. And you have to help help define and help people understand how how upstream and downstream activities are affected by, by each step along the way. Absolutely. That's really interesting. I want to go to Christy really quick and then over to Teresa for the process. But so, Christy, what if I'm a small business and I, I can't buy double the inventory? You know, that's just it's just not in the budget for me. What what happens or how do you advise in those scenarios when really that supply chain tactic isn't just going to work for every single business? It's hard. And you, I've seen some people take out lines of credit and they use their whole line of credit to go buy inventory. I had a client that did that last year and they spent, they got a line of credit for 120 K and they spent it all on their inventory and they're able to pay it back enough where the interest compiling on it, it, it made more sense than for them to worry about their shelves being empty and they may not have any sales that month. So I think there's there's different tactics in in that way that smaller businesses can utilize to get the inventory they need without it putting a huge financial burden. There's other things they can do. Um, for instance, if you have a supplier, maybe the supplier holds it all for you and you kind of buy from them as you use it, kind of like a blanket order like some people have, but they they charge you a minimum fee to store the inventory. And I've had clients do that also. Excellent. Yeah, that, that's great. And I know you'll kind of expand upon all of those within your um, small business growth talk or keynote and panel with Amanda. But Teresa, I, since I want to expand on something Braden said, that there, it seems like there's a lot of key learnings or optimizations you can get from mapping out your business process. So I, I wondered if you could give us some feedback on, on how to begin doing that. Does, was it the smile that gave it away again? Like, oh, I have one for that one too. It's really helpful for the moderator because you're like, and to her. Hello. No, I, I think it's it's really important to understand the voices of your business. So um, in, in, in Ella, Lean Six Sigma Black Ball, I was trained to look at the different aspects of your business, business the voice of the process, the customer, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And really, when you really understand how those different things are performing, you can target which area to optimize. So, if you have a specific area that your your performance, your actual, is either above or below, depending on what your target is, you know I need to spend my time here. So, especially in the environment today, we don't have a lot of time to figure out what we need to do. So, using your metrics, using KPIs, using data to understand what's the biggest bang for my buck is what I would suggest a company do. And then spend some time and some resources really understanding how I can optimize this process. What do I need to do? And also the impacts upstream and downstream. That is so very important because if I change something without asking Eric, Braden and Christy and, and Kyler, I might have a negative impact to any of those processes you own and it would be bad for business. So that's why it's important to make sure everyone's on the same page. We're all in the same room. If, if you own a part of that process, I need to I need for you to understand what my decisions impact is on you. I would start out with KPIs and looking at the voices of the business, but making sure everyone's involved is super important. Absolutely. And um, that alignment, we can just keep circling back to that. Um, and so it sounds like based on what you said, the alignment is not only at the executive level, but there has to be some cross-functional communication. And I'll just open this question up to the group is how do you make sure that when you are implementing a technology that you really do um, engage everyone in, involved in the business? What's kind of the best process to do that? I'm going to give you a little nugget of information. 
<laughs> always. I, I think that when you look at that process and just from my perspective, people don't think change management is, you know, it's, it's a hard thing. It, it's more, you know, rainbows, bunnies, kittens, whatever. It's really not like when you start talking to people about their interactions in the process and you ask them, how does this impact or what is your solution? That's your start of change management without anybody knowing that's your start of change management. Mm -hmm. And you can really build on that to help move it along as long as you're following the protocol and you're understanding you're including everybody. So I just wanted to throw that out to you because it popped in my head. So, yeah. And that's a good, you know, soft promo for our mm -hmm. ground control podcast next week. Um, so if you're not subscribed, you can get our ground control podcast anywhere that you get your podcast. And we, ch we cover all things change management and talk a lot about how do you attach a business value. And we do some, some real tangible metrics and some case studies about how change management does truly affect revenue. So thank you for that you know, a little soft pitch for me to promote our podcast, but um, across the room, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Another thing that we're going to talk about a lot at digital stratosphere and we hear a lot in the, in the industry is, um, you know, software as a service. So looking mm -hmm. at migrating to the cloud or cloud technologies, and we see big pushes from vendors to kind of get our clients on that. So I, I wanted to get your, um, your two cents, Brayden, on kind of what the cloud looks like from an overall logical, I guess, standpoint. So when you, it sounds like a, a really big buzzword in the industry and everyone wants to go to the cloud, but what are some considerations that you should really kind of, you know, look at as a business when you're considering a cloud solution? Yeah, I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is partnership. Uh, you know, anytime you're, you're looking at a, uh, uh, cloud system, you you want to understand that partnership long term, and because because you are signing up for uh, you know in, in a lot of cases subscription models and and uh, uh, you know hosted services and things of that nature, you want to understand how they're they're operating those systems so that you can uh, uh, work within those parameters and you're not locked into something that's not going to be flexible and working for you. Uh, so there's there's a number of considerations. I think uh, I've seen. More recently, uh, a lot more clients moving to a, a hybrid model, uh, so cloud and on-prem. Uh, that's been beneficial for a lot of growth companies. Uh, there's been, uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, challenge around some of the legacy cloud uh, instances where we're going back and kind of reworking uh, large implementations into uh, kind of the next wave of uh, upgrades or the next wave of development. Um, those are challenges that you need to be mindful of as you uh, uh, bring on cloud systems because uh, they're not easily uh, uh, kind of decommissioned or, or broken down uh, like on-prem systems can be. Um, so there's a number of considerations that are longer term in terms of the, the management of the system and how you, how you partner. Uh, and so that cultural fit is extremely important. Uh, and then also the support models and, and some of the contracting and, and some of the uh, um, uh, negotiations at the beginning of, of any cloud approach uh, are extremely important. Absolutely. That that right sizing piece, like, is this the right choice, even though, you, you know, you think that this emerging technology is awesome and the cloud's been around for a while. But it really the question, it sounds like you're you're asking, is it right for your business? And that right. should be the focus. Um, I know our sponsor at Estes Group, Brad Beeks, who's a, the president over there, is going to be talking about cloud migration strategies on day three. So definitely tune in. That's his expertise. That's why we brought him on. Um, we don't typically bring on a ton of sponsors for this event because we want to make sure that the, the content is really authentic and actionable for our audiences. That's our priority. But he does such a great job, if you've seen him on our Ground Control podcast, of explaining that. So. We're excited for that. I wonder, Eric, if you can talk about a little bit about kind of the the struggle with a software vendor. We've seen lately that sometimes, like for uh, Microsoft Great Plains, for example, that they're sunsetting that system. They kind of rolled that back a little bit after um, some pushback. But what is kind of the client's role in, in that communication and knowing that the software vendor is going to try to sell you the newest and greatest and sparkliest package? 
but how can you make sure that you kind of stay grounded as a company in working with software vendors? Well, I think the first thing is to remember that it's your business and you can't let a software vendor pull the gun to your head and say, you need to move to the cloud now because we've moved to the cloud. Therefore you have to as well. Um, because to, uh, Braden's point and to build on some of that, I mean, it is at the end of the day, cloud solutions are generally more expensive in the long term. Um, software vendors hate when I say that they argue with me about it all the time, but it's absolutely true. If you have, it's like leasing a car, if you lease a car, and you have a monthly payment that never goes away, you never own that car, you're constantly gonna be paying on it. That's just more expensive than buying a car. Now you can argue, well, you've got less maintenance and you know there's other, there's other benefits of the cloud that are maybe non-financial, but you can't go in assuming that you're gonna have a lower cost option because cloud is gonna cost you more. It may be that it's more business value and, it, and there's a clear ROI, that's, that's fine. But you just have to recognize that the cloud uh, is not gonna be cheaper. Um, so those are the two things I'd say is don't, you know, don't have a, don't allow a gun to be held to your head. Don't be forced into moving to the cloud just because someone wants you to, or someone uh, else's best interest are for you to go to the cloud. And then really just look at all your options. And Braden had some really good points about hybrid options and um, on-premise is not a terrible thing. I mean, I know that's just not cool to say, but on-premise is not the end of the world. And there's certain things that make a lot of sense in the cloud. Like CRM is a good example of a system that just makes sense to put in the cloud. But when you start talking about manufacturing sites at remote locations with unreliable infrastructure, mm -hmm. cloud doesn't make quite as much sense in those cases. Or if you're going from a really low cost on-premise system now to a higher, a much higher cost uh, cloud option, that may, not, may or may not make sense for you as well. So those are just some of the things to think through and to navigate. But, but again, I think to your point, um, you have to do this objectively and you have to sort of sanitize the sales and marketing messaging that you're going to get from the industry because our industry is very incestuous, I'd say, you know, in that software vendors are financing the system integrators. They're also financing the industry analysts. So if you go to Gardner or Forrester or any system integrator, they're going to have a very pro vendor message because they're all feeding each other uh, economically. So the, you just have to recognize the lay of the land and do what's best for your business. Absolutely. And, and I think that we kind of went whole circle on, you know, the processes and how really you have to know your processes, know your business back and forth um, to know the technology and kind of that preach that preaching message that we always say is, is letting the processes lead the technology, not the other way around. And so I, I wonder from your standpoint, Christy, because I can only imagine um, you know, kind of defining processes within, within a small business community that it's just like, well, Bob in accounting has that spreadsheet over there that he's used for 35 years. And, you know, we don't really know what's on it. Like, how do you how do you help kind of grow up in in um, defining those processes so you can maybe go towards a cloud solution? But if your, say, data isn't ready for that or your processes aren't ready for that, it sounds like that would be a big barrier to entry. It is, and we have to start out with what are best practices and then start adapting some of the things they do to that to get a foundation and then plugging in what are the unique things that you may do. So if Bob has this accounting sheet that he's had, it's sitting down with him, what does this accounting sheet do? And, and taking that information, putting it into uh, a process. So it could be, oh, well, I get the name and then I create an invoice manually over here and then I do this, okay, so, we're taking an order, we're making an invoice from it, and we're sending it out. Something could be as simple as that, but it may be 15 steps with how it's done today, and then we're gonna shrink it down to like five or six. And the same thing I'll see with um, timekeeping. Well, we just pencil up what time we came in, what time we left, and then so-and-so goes and adds it all up. Okay, so let, let's throw our pencils away, and what are, what are some other technologies that may be a minimal entry point to come in that would be so expensive for them, but would save a lot of time later on where that person isn't spending. Maybe they're spending eight to 10 hours of pay period just trying to figure out what the times are. Well, mm -hmm. now I've, whatever the cost that person is, I'll have saved it with a technology component that can do that. And so it's try, showing the value, but then also figuring out what are these little processes and how can we build them out to be something good? Yeah. 
So discovering and kind of optimizing and seeing where there's op opportunity for technology to enhance that experience. And Teresa, I bet Bob is kind of scared because, you know, that's kind of his wheelhouse, right? So how can, you know, businesses have that conversation of like, well, what do you do? But by the way, you know, relax so we don't get, you know, a, a really reactionary face resistance. Yeah, um, I have no poker face because you read it. So I've been taking notes and just <laughs> one of the things that jumped out to me when Christy was saying that is optimization does not mean reduction in manpower, right? And I think that's the biggest fear that you have with a lot of people that have their own spreadsheets or their own, you know, workarounds or this is the way I've done it. They have that the, the, the false sense of security, like I'm going to keep this and it's going to work. If you can communicate the message of it's not a reduction, it's an, a reallocation. Like there's a lot of things we can do to help business move forward, be more efficient, be more cost conscious, be more profitable. More profit means what for the business? It means growth. So redirecting the energy, redirecting the conversation from I'm going to lose my job fear to, okay, I'm going to be able to have new opportunities or new um, responsibilities to replace the old. So I feel like I'm more efficient. I'm more productive. Tap into that and it, it'll go a long way. And I think adding to what you said too, it's showing people how valuable they are and yep. other jobs that they can perform instead of maybe just a data entry of plugging numbers in all day. hundred percent. And that's where you get, quote unquote, the change management growth, the buy in, the ownership and the accountability. And if you don't go like what Christy said, if you don't go that extra step to define what that future state role is going to look like, it could actually yep. backfire. And then people assume the worst that their job is going to go away or you're not going to value them anymore. Mm -hmm. So you have to clearly articulate and define what that is. You know, what is that person going to do with their time now that you've made it half there it is? Absolutely. Well said. Well, I think that, you know, is such a great snapshot. And I, I appreciate all of you that, you know, kind of gave us some insight into what you've been talking about. And, you know, us, we could talk about this all day here at Third Stage. But I want to kind of circle back around to Digital Stratosphere and ask each of you what you're most kind of excited about, whether it's your own content or another keynote um, piece, because we just have such a plethora of variety in there. Um, and just a reminder to our audience, we did post the registration link. Um, again, the event is completely free. So you can go ahead and go over there and hold your spot. And also for our international audience, the recordings will be available. So say you don't want to join in the middle of the night in Australia. I hear that. Sleep is everything. Um, so you can go ahead and um, just register and the recordings will be distributed and available for you. But um, let's go to you first, Braden. What are you most looking forward to and knowing that you were in Digital Stratosphere last year um, and then this is kind of your second year? You're an old pro. <laughs> right. I, I look forward to the interaction. You know, we always get a uh, good question and answer uh, out, of, out of events like this. And I, I think, uh, you know, I always appreciate the questions. They always bring uh, good perspective. And uh, for me, uh, that's always valuable in, in conversations as we uh, work with our clients. So I, I'm really looking forward to the interaction. Excellent. What about you, Christy? You, I, I think, this. what is this? You're like fourth digital <laughs> strategy? Something like that. <laughs> I feel like the old person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always, same thing to what Brain said. I really like people's questions. It can be things that we haven't thought of to maybe uh, bring into our processes or make a good topic about it for a podcast or a blog or be able to really hone in on, hey, we're starting to see a trend and it's coming up in these comments too. How do we speak to this? And then I also like what Braden can talk about supply chain because that stuff just really interests me. Mm -hmm. So I'm really looking forward to that. Absolutely. What about you, Teresa? This is your first, I think, digital stratosphere, right? Uh, I think it's my second, maybe. Oh. Point five? No. <laughs> you um, have you on all the podcasts. You, you don't even know. <laughs> so I, I, I love learning new things. Like I'm never going to profess to know everything about everything. And, and I think one of the interesting things about, about this is 
the variety of topics that you mm -hmm. can learn from, right? So I think super cool is the scaling for growth, growth Christy, and the cybersecurity, because I think those two are are very important, especially in terms of, and, and the supply chain, but in terms of the environment now, the business environment now, um, you have to be able to do both and understand how those impacts could, what, what what those impacts would have on your business. So I'm really interested in those. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That cybersecurity is a good call mm -hmm. and the data management as well. We have a lot of really technical people coming to talk about um, those types of kind of emerging trends and, and really you need that right now in today's day and age. So what about you, Eric? Um, you know, you obviously are the brain child behind um, Digital Stratosphere and our Stratosphere events as well. So what are you looking forward to this year? Well, honestly, it's very similar to what the other three are looking for. <laughs> I can't just repeat that. Um, but, but I will say that, you know, in addition to, I always learn a ton from the people that join the, the um, sessions, whether it's in the questions they ask or the comments they make or both. Um, but I also think what, what's going to be really interesting about this one is, you know, we haven't done this since, what was it, spring of last year? I can't mm -hmm. remember the last stratosphere we did. So it's been almost a year, you know, nine months or whatever it's been. And so I'll be curious to see just, you know, this content is, to me, most of the content we cover is very timeless. I mean, it's stuff that applies mm -hmm. now, tomorrow, the next day. But right now there are some nuances to what we're covering with supply chain management and labor shortages and um, mm -hmm. other things that are, somewhat unique and, and things are changing. Um, other things like change management and other uh, kind of core fundamental stuff is is still relevant, maybe even more relevant now. So I think just hearing the content, hearing the other speakers in the context of where the world is today, uh, to me, that's, that's going to be pretty exciting because I don't remember a time in my career where things have changed this fast, mm -hmm. technologically, culturally, socially, uh, all that stuff. So I think that that ultimately affects the, our content as well. Yeah, absolutely. And just so our audience is aware, we do live Q&A and it truly is live. The speaker and the moderator, which is usually me, who just pops in and says like, you know, we have a question from so and so. They really do tailor their content to directly answer the question, um, especially like on Christie's side, our small business folks. We have a lot of change management, a lot of HR audience and then obviously the supply chain everyone wants to know how to fix that so just from a logistics standpoint i just wanted everyone to know that and then um i'll share what i'm most excited about um i always learn a lot about emerging technologies so when we talk about ai machine learning predictive analytics those types of things and then also emerging markets is kind of new this year for us and learning about how connectivity affects software solutions um, and then kind of niche systems or creating a uh, network within your area that can kind of support you if that might not be something that that you've considered before. So I'm excited to see those new things on our agenda and um, our sponsors that will join us. That really is their bread and butter. That's what they do every single day. Um, so having that subject matter expert in things like ERP Cloud um, will be such a, a huge asset. But just a reminder, you can head over to stratosphere2022.com to register and you'll see Teresa, Christy, Eric and Brayden all on the agenda. And we are excited, obviously, if you can't tell to have you um, this year. And, and it's definitely something that is a, a main driver for our year to come. So set those strategies, register um, and make sure to join us. But thank you, Eric, Teresa, Christy and Brayden for giving us some insights today. Yep. Bye. Thanks for Thanks. Yeah, you bet. You have a great weekend and we will see you just in a few weeks. Sounds good. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.